Greetings and salutations, Happy New Year, and welcome to Lost in Video. In my last video, I had a little more hair, but more importantly, we took a look at a nice little Christmas movie, 1984 sci-fi cult classic, Transfers. In this video, we're going to take a look into a different genre and a nice cheerful way to close out this holiday season. 1990s Misery Directed by Rob Reiner, Misery is a psychological thriller. It's an adaptation of a novel by the same name, written by the iconic author Stephen King. The production of Misery began when Castle Rock Entertainment, a label of Warner Brothers Entertainment and Warner Brothers Discovery, acquired the rights to Stephen King's novel. Castle Rock Entertainment was founded by Martin Schaefer, Andrew Scheinman, Glenn Padnick, Alan Horn, and director Rob Reiner. In addition to his involvement with Castle Rock Entertainment, Reiner was also chosen to direct Misery for his ability to bring out strong performances from actors while balancing horror with character-driven drama. Stephen King was initially reluctant to sell the movie rights to Misery, but because he enjoyed Rob Reiner's adaptation of another Stephen King story, Stand By Me, King eventually agreed, and the rest is history. Casting, of course, played a crucial role in shaping the film's success. James Caan was selected for the lead role of Paul Sheldon due to his ability to convey vulnerability and strength simultaneously. Jack Nicholson was originally offered the role of Paul Sheldon, but he passed on it due to his involvement in another Stephen King adaptation, Stanley Kubrick's 1980 masterpiece, The Shining. If you've seen my Thief video, you'll know by now that I'm a big fan of James Caan's work that I have seen, and so of course I'm thrilled that he ended up being the final choice for this role, as much as I enjoy Jack Nicholson. I agree with Jack, though, and that him starring in another Stephen King adaptation would have felt a bit repetitive, so bringing Caan in was the right call. Kathy Bates auditioned for the role of Annie Wilkes and delivered such an outstanding performance that she secured her place as one of cinema's most memorable villains. Her portrayal earned her critical acclaim, including an Academy Award for Best Actress. For those reasons, Bates is probably most well known for her portrayal of Annie Wilkes here. She's had a very successful and enduring career otherwise though, having been featured in many other movies such as Titanic, About Schmidt, and The Waterboy, as well as television series such as The Office, and even voice work on shows like American Dad and King of the Hill. As if winning Best Actress for her role as Annie Wilkes wasn't enough, in doing so, Bates also became the first woman to win a Best Actress Oscar for a horror-slash-thriller film. Richard Farnsworth appears in the film as Sheriff Buster, a likable and easygoing yet ill-fated character in his own right. Farnsworth may be most well known for his role in Misery, but he's also been featured in some other movies, such as the disappointing Chinatown sequel The Two Jakes, as well as the infamous Sylvester Stallone Dolly Parton team up Rhinestone. He also had a featured role on the television series Roots, as well as an uncredited role as a sheriff in Blazing Saddles, and a role in Robert Redford's The Natural. The screenplay adaptation was written by William Goldman, who skillfully transformed King's tense and suspenseful story into a compelling script. It was actually Goldman who had advised Reiner on hiring Kathy Bates for the part of Annie Wilkes, stating that she was their first and only choice for the role. According to Goldman, the same can't be said for James Caan, however, as apparently in addition to Jack Nicholson, the Paul Sheldon role was also offered to Warren Beatty, Robert De Niro, Michael Douglas, Richard Dreyfuss, Harrison Ford, Morgan Freeman, Mel Gibson, Gene Hackman, Dustin Hoffman, William Hurt twice, Kevin Kline, Al Pacino, Robert Redford, Denzel Washington, and Bruce Willis. So James Caan wasn't the first and only choice for Paul Sheldon, but again, I believe he was the right choice. When it came to working together, James Caan and Kathy Bates did not see eye to eye and often clashed over differing acting methods. Bates was more accustomed to rehearsing and going over the material with her scene partners, probably due to her background in theater. Khan, on the other hand, opted for as little rehearsing as possible, doing everything for the first time when the cameras began rolling for what he felt was a more authentic presentation. In response to Bates and Khan's disagreement, Reiner advised Bates to use her real-life frustrations in her performance of Annie Wilkes against James Khan, which I certainly believe, given what we see in the movie. Filming took place primarily in California, with some scenes shot on location in Colorado to capture the isolated mountain feeling depicted in the book. 
Cinematographer Barry Sunnenfield collaborated closely with director Rob Reiner to create visually striking shots that enhanced both the tension and the emotional depth of each scene. The development of Misery benefited from meticulous attention to detail regarding set design and costume choices. Production designer Norman Garwood meticulously recreated Paul Sheldon's cabin according to Stephen King's descriptions, ensuring accuracy down to every intricate detail. Costume designer Gloria Gresham carefully crafted Annie Wilkes' wardrobe to reflect her personality traits. Most notable, her frumpy and outdated attire, which added to the unsettling nature of her character. The film's score was composed by Mark Shaman, who created a hauntingly beautiful soundtrack that perfectly complemented the suspenseful atmosphere. It's nothing special to me, but it's just perfect for what this movie needs. His use of eerie piano melodies and strings effectively heightened tension during pivotal moments in the movie. By the way, if you're enjoying this content, please give this video a like, share it with your movie-loving friends, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It really means a lot to me. I also want to know your thoughts on Misery as well, so leave a comment down below. We open up in the cold of winter. Acclaimed writer Paul Sheldon, played by James Caan, takes a long drag from a cigarette and throws a snowball before he takes his nice snow-covered drive through the opening credits. During this opening, the song Shotgun by J.R. Walker and the All-Stars plays, which I never really paid attention to before, but it is some pretty clear foreshadowing of something that will happen later on in the movie. The trip goes awry when this movie reminds you that this is an adaptation of a Stephen King novel as Paul's car begins sliding out of control and eventually flies off the road in a brutal accident. We cut to a flashback where Paul is having dinner at a restaurant with his agent where we see that he's not very proud of his most acclaimed work, The Misery Books. However, due to their massive popularity in this fictional world, we see that they've taken over Paul Sheldon's life and that he's ready to move on to writing different projects that he's more passionate about. Back in the present time, Paul is dragged out of his van by Kathy Bates, or as the infamous character is actually named, Annie Wilkes. When Paul awakens from his traumatic accident, Annie immediately tells him that she's his biggest fan and also, luckily, a nurse. She sets Paul up in a bed after having done what appears to be a very rudimentary and sketchy job attending to his horribly broken legs. She also starts giving him pills, and it's a consequence of nothing but good fortune that she has all this medical stuff just laying around her house. Nothing more. While all of this is going on, Sheldon's agent notices that Paul hasn't been in touch with her and begins to wonder if something's wrong. She contacts the local sheriff in the town that Paul is last known to be in, who tells her he will find out what he can. Sheriff Buster is an easygoing and likable guy, and as soon as we meet him we trust that he's the sort of man who will do the right thing. His relationship with his wife, who is the police department receptionist, is also very endearing, as the two have a more humorous back and forth throughout their scenes together. We go back to an interaction between Annie and Paul, where Annie's telling Paul how she's been following him since he arrived at the lodge where he always goes to to work on his novels. A little weird, no? This doesn't seem to trigger any red flags for Paul, or perhaps he's just being coy as we see him do later on in the movie. He's also got two badly broken legs and he's generally just banged up, so it's understandable that he might not have all of his faculties. I've had a broken leg before, and just trying to imagine Paul's situation in this specific circumstance with two broken legs and no professional medical treatment with real equipment is painful enough. Annie tells Paul that she noticed he had a manuscript for his new book, which means that she either has x-ray vision or she went through his stuff, which again doesn't bother Paul in the slightest. He even agrees to let her read it, which again, I can't blame him, since one probably wouldn't want to be rude in a situation like this where he's literally at her mercy, and perhaps from his point of view so far, she's also been incredibly nice to him. What harm could it possibly do to let her read his new book a little bit early? While she's feeding Paul tomato soup, Annie becomes enraged that Paul's new book contains vulgar language and a conversation that alludes to Annie's delusions and her refusal to accept reality for what it can be at times. After she flips out, she apologizes to Paul and tells him that she loves him. So we jump from one extreme to the next, we see one red flag after the other, and yet there's simply nothing Paul can do about it. Elsewhere, Sheriff Buster conducts his own investigation into Paul's disappearance, where he stops by the lodge to confirm that Frank was there before he comes oh so close, discovering Sheldon's car, which is now buried in snow. I love the interactions between Sheriff Buster and his wife, who seem to lead it fun and exciting lives, for now at least. 
Annie tells Paul that because of the snowstorm that he had his accident in, the phone lines are still down and the roads are still closed, even though she clearly just went to town to buy Paul's new book. Paul's worried that his daughter hasn't heard from him as he was supposed to be with her for her birthday. Annie's disinterested in this and only wants to talk about Sheldon's new misery book. Annie introduces Paul to her pet pig, which she named Misery, proving once again to Paul that she is indeed his number one fan and definitely super unhinged. Once Annie finishes reading the new Misery book, she really goes ballistic so that she ends up just telling Paul the truth. She never called the hospital, never called his agent, nobody knows where he is and his survival is completely dependent on her. The issue for Annie is that in Paul's latest Misery book, he decides to kill off the character because as we know, he's ready to move on to material that he's more passionate about and can be proud of, as again, Misery is just trash to Paul. After Annie goes off on Paul, smashes a stool into pieces against the wall, and threatens him, she goes out for a midnight joy ride on those closed roads, and Paul painfully dumps himself out of bed and crawls all the way to the door with all of his injuries, only to find that the door has been locked shut. He truly is trapped. We go back to our friendly Sheriff Buster who's still trying to find Paul, and even though he hasn't gotten on the right track yet, he hasn't given up investigating. Annie comes into Paul's room, now all chirpy and peachy, and drags Paul back into his bed. She lets Paul know that she was once on a witness stand, but doesn't really elaborate beyond that. I've lost track of which red flag that one is, but I think by now we've seen enough that Paul finally truly understands the gravity of his situation. Annie also tells Paul that God told her she's supposed to show Paul the way, and forces Paul to burn his new book. He has no copies and really doesn't want to destroy his hard work in something that he's actually proud of, but Annie covers him in lighter fluid until he finally lights a match and burns his book. A helicopter flies overhead the Wilkes property as the sheriff is trying to find Paul's car. It's just a fleeting moment of hope for Paul, but the helicopter flies away and Paul is left alone with Annie. In a fun little cameo, you might have noticed that none other than director Rob Reiner himself is the helicopter pilot here. Around this time, Paul stops taking the pills that Annie has been giving them and hides them. Annie also buys a typewriter and paper for Paul, expecting him to write a new book, Misery's Return, a book where he can undo the injustice that was done to the character that Annie loves so much in his last book. At this point, Paul gets Annie to leave the house by telling her that he needs a different type of paper to work on because the kind that Annie bought smudges. Annie doesn't take this well and slams a book on Paul's broken legs before storming off to town to get Paul's paper. While Annie is off, Paul uses this as an opportunity to escape. He finds a hairpin and, now in a wheelchair, he's able to actually pick the lock to the door that he's locked in. Frank is deflated to find that the phone in Annie's house is only for show and doesn't work. He knocks over a penguin figurine and it nearly falls to the ground breaking, but Paul catches it. However, he doesn't put it back the exact same way as it was, an oversight that he will regret later. Paul also finds a bunch of the pills Annie's been feeding him which are apparently sedatives. He grabs a bunch of them and hides them on his person, at which point he tries one last time to escape the house. All the doors are locked though and so Paul has to scramble to get back into his room and cover up all traces of his little adventure through the house before Annie gets back. The sheriff, meanwhile, in his Rob Reiner phone helicopter, finally discovers Paul's car and he's presumed dead by the highway patrol and officer Shane Douglas. Not the cool Shane Douglas from ECW discloses to the media that Paul must have crawled out of his car and frozen to death somewhere out in the woods due to the recent snowstorm that happened after Paul's car accident. The sheriff, on the other hand, isn't convinced that Paul Sheldon is dead, so there is still hope for Paul. Paul and Annie seem to develop a routine where Paul writes and Annie then reads and either approves or disapproves of Paul's work. Here, Annie is finally thrilled with Paul's work. Paul uses this opportunity to ask Annie to have dinner with him where he hopes to drug her with the pills he's been stocking up. At dinner, Paul manages to get the drugs into the wine, but then unfortunately Annie knocks over the glass and spills everything. Now, just like that, all the saving up and all the stocking up of sedatives was out the window, just like Paul's last novel he was forced to burn. We get a montage of Paul's writing. He moves up to chapter 12, then quickly breezes all the way up to chapter 32. He also uses his typewriter as a weight to build up his strength over this period of time. The next time he sees Annie, she is clearly in another dangerous state of mind. She explains to Paul that she loves him as a writer, but she loves everything else about him too. She says that she knows Paul doesn't love her back and she becomes depressed knowing that he will soon finish the book, heal up his legs, and leave. She shows him her cool gun which she's thinking about using on the two of them and then leaves Paul in the lonely darkness of the night to reflect on that pleasant thought. 
With Annie out of the house again, Paul goes exploring and finds a photo album filled with some of Annie's greatest memories. Newspaper clippings that detail various infant and elderly deaths in hospitals, as well as a picture of Annie herself in court. Yeah, great memories indeed. Paul is also able to steal a big kitchen knife and hides it under his mattress as a means of self-defense. Annie comes in one night and injects him with a syringe which knocks him out. Paul wakes up to Annie standing over him. She found the knife and to make sure that Paul can never run away again, she does the infamous hobbling technique that so many people think of when they think of this movie. Once again, as someone who's suffered the pain of a broken leg before, this is hard to watch. In Stephen King's original novel, Annie actually doesn't hobble Paul and rather cuts his foot off instead. The movie's screenwriter William Goldman actually specifically wanted to adapt Stephen King's novel due to the foot amputation scene and was heavily disappointed when he saw the revision of his script had changed the way in which Annie would cripple Paul to the hobbling technique. However, when Goldman saw the hobbling technique on the big screen, he changed his mind as it became one of the most hard to watch acts of horror in the entire genre and most certainly left an impact on audiences. Next, the sheriff sees Annie get into a verbal confrontation with someone and her temper makes him look into her background on a hunch. He finds the same articles that Annie had in her photo album, the happy ones where she was tried and arrested for murdering elderlies and infants. He then finds that she's been buying writing paper and suddenly he puts it all together with Paul Sheldon's disappearance. He arrives at Annie's, where Annie explains her fandom of Paul Sheldon to the sheriff and details to him a conversation she had with God once again in which she was instructed to become the new Paul Sheldon and to write her own books. Of course, Sheriff Buster knows she's out of her mind by this point and investigates some rooms of the house while Annie makes him some cocoa. Paul, who once again has been drugged by Annie, is unable to call for help. That is, until the sheriff is about to leave, which of course is when Paul comes to and cries out for help. This causes the sheriff to re-enter the house where he finds the secret doorway that Annie has Paul hidden away in. At this moment, the saddest part of the movie happens when the sheriff is blown in half by Annie and her double-barreled shotgun. Apparently, at some point around here, a scene was cut from the movie in which Annie repeatedly runs over a younger police officer with a lawnmower. Director Rob Reiner said that the reason the scene had been cut was because he was afraid audiences would find it unintentionally hilarious guilty as charged. Annie says the time is now for her to kill Paul and then herself, but Paul tells her he must finish his current book and give misery back to the world before dawn and then they can leave the world together. This would be a sweet and romantic sentiment if it were true, but Paul's lying. Just kidding. Once Paul finishes the book, however, he sets it on fire just as Annie forced him to burn the book he actually cared about. This leads into our final climactic fight as the two brawl all over the place, with Annie getting her head smashed in with a typewriter. I love this fight scene between between the wheelchair-bound Paul Sheldon and powerful Annie Wilkes, which is pretty brutal. In the end, Sheldon is able to defeat Annie as she meets her violent end. We fast forward later to see Paul Sheldon with a cane now as he's permanently affected by the damage done to his legs by Annie. He enters a restaurant to meet with his agent as they discuss the great success of his new book, and his agent floats the idea of Frank writing a non-fiction book to exploit the traumatic events he went through with Annie. This doesn't appeal to Paul, who hallucinates that a waitress is Annie. Although Paul seems to be doing well on the surface, he still sees Annie everywhere he goes because he's permanently traumatized by the horrific events that took place during their encounter. Roll credits. Hey friends, I just wanted to interrupt to say that if you've heard the synthwave music in the background, that's from White Bat Audio and specifically Carl Casey. I just wanted to give him credit and give White Bat Audio credit for the amazing background music. It's copyright free and royalty free. If you go to their YouTube page, even if you don't have anything that you need to use music for, for copyright free reasons, it's just great music to listen to. So I had to give Carl Casey a shout out and White Bat Audio. Thanks again, you guys. In the chilling realm of psychological horrors, Misery stands as proof of the directorial prowess of Rob Reiner. From the first frame to the heart-pounding conclusion, Rob Reiner crafts an intense and immersive experience that keeps audiences gripped in a vice of suspense. The movie stands as evidence to the talent of everybody involved with the filmmaking process here, but Reiner's direction, while perhaps not the most stylistic or unique in and of itself, is just right for what this movie needed in order to be fleshed out, and it was a perfect match. As we noted earlier, one of the multiple reasons that Reiner was set to Hell Misery was due to how pleased Stephen King had been with his adaptation 
adaptation of Stand By Me, so Reiner was no stranger to Stephen King's works going into this film, and both films are rightfully considered successful in their own right. James Caan delivers a performance that adds layers of complexity to the captive author, Paul Sheldon. Khan's portrayal is nothing short of captivating as he navigates the treacherous terrain of captivity with a vulnerability that tugs at the audience's heartstrings. From the moment Paul Sheldon finds himself at the mercy of his number one fan, played by Kathy Bates, Khan expertly conveys the emotional and physical toll of his character's harrowing ordeal. His journey from a celebrated author to a helpless prisoner is a riveting exploration of the resilience and despair a man can handle, and Khan navigates this arc with an authenticity that is both powerful and poignant. My my favorite James Caan movie is still Thief, but Misery serves as a wonderful chapter in his catalog. With all of that being said, I think it's universally agreed upon that this movie belongs to Kathy Bates. Kathy Bates delivers a tour de force performance as Annie Wilkes that is nothing short of a masterclass in acting. As the disturbed and obsessive number one fan of Paul Sheldon, Bates commands the screen with a nuanced blend of charm, unpredictability, and sheer madness. What sets Bates' performance as Wilkes apart from many other famous movie villains is her ability to convey a complex range of emotions. One minute she's the caring nurse, and the next she's a force of terror, seamlessly transitioning between these facets of Annie's personality. It's this duality that makes Bates' performance so compelling and keeps viewers on the edge of their seats. Bates' chemistry with James Caan is palpable and adds an extra layer of tension to the narrative. The power dynamics between the two characters are expertly portrayed by Bates, making Annie Wilkes one of the most memorable and terrifying villains in cinematic history. The relationship that Kathy Bates and James Caan apparently shared off-camera would have clearly played a role in the chemistry between these two, and perhaps it was destiny that Caan and Bates would cross paths to churn out the precise dynamic that would make this movie work so well and become so memorable. Some people might say the hobbling scene is the most memorable scene in the movie, and it wouldn't be hard to see why. However, for me personally, what really sticks out is the haunting look on the face of Paul Sheldon as he hallucinates Annie Wilkes approaching him at the restaurant at the end of the film. The haunting look on Paul's face gives us just a taste of the trauma that he will indeed be living with for the rest of his life, and to me, that's the scariest aspect of this film's ending. In conclusion, like many other folks, I think Misery has got to be one of my all-time favorite thrillers. As much as I love James Caan, Kathy Bates is what makes the film iconic, although I appreciate Caan taking on the role of Paul Sheldon as well, as so many actors apparently turned down the role due to the fear of being overshadowed by the Annie Wilkes role. That's all fair since Annie Wilkes is the most memorable role in the film, but again, I believe everyone involved did a wonderful job in making this movie the thriller classic that it is. Well, that just about does it for Misery. If you're a fan of the movie, then I hope you enjoyed this retrospective. I certainly had a good time revisiting the movie and learning a bunch of new things that I never knew before. 2023 was a great year for my channel, and that's due to all of you. I want to wish all of my subscribers a happy new year. I hope you have a great 2024. And again, thanks for stopping by, and thank you for getting lost in video. I'll see you next time. Have you all got amnesia? They just cheated us!